Hey guys, I'm Tom. And I'm Morgan. And this video is brought to you by a partnership between MTG Tournament Grinder and Pats Games. Follow the Pats Games shipping link in the description below to get great prices on select modern and standard singles shipped straight to your door. Hey, what's up guys? MTG Tournament Grinder here, and I am joined by my good friend Morgan. Hey, Morgan Bush. I'm a sponsored player for Pats Games, a magic store here in Austin, Texas. The one that you film uh, your videos at a lot of the time. Yes, yeah, so you might have heard the uh, the sounds of FNM from Pats Games in the background of my videos. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we have a good time at Pats. Uh, so we had an idea that we would like to make a top 10 cards for modern out of Guilds of Ravnica. But um, you may have seen one or several videos to that effect. So Morgan actually had a nice twist on that idea. Why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, so one of my favorite things to do, and I think one one of all of our favorite things to do um, when when uh, spoiler season comes out, is to look at the cards, find your favorite ones, brew around them. Um, it's really yes. easy to brew around the top ones, you know, like Assassin's Trophy and and Knight of Autumn. They just sort of like build themselves cards that are that good, but they just scream modern as soon as you read them. Exactly. You know, those are the ones that I oh man, I picked up my foils of Knight of Autumn really quickly. Um, but one of my favorite things to do is you know once the dust has settled. Just sort of like go into the weeds in in, in the set and, and try to find some some spots, some like secret spots where you know cards that we may have overlooked could be really really good. You know, like a, what's the term? A sleepers list. Correct. Something that's to the eye when you first read it, you wouldn't assume was, is good, but actually does have a home in the right deck. Exactly. Gotcha. So we decided to break down the list into two sections because we were we were going through it and. There are actually like a lot more cards than I thought that there would be that, that we had disagreement over and that, that seemed pretty viable in a lot of different strategies. You know, I thought so too. As you mentioned, there's the obvious ones like Assassin's Trophy and such, mm -hmm. but um, quite a few more than I had anticipated that uh, upon closer inspection seemed like they have a home in modern. Absolutely. So I think that we were pretty able to, to, to knock down the top 10 and we'll get to that in a bit, but there are also some stuff that we disagreed on. and. I didn't want to just not talk about them, so I figure we might as well include an honorable mention for those. Well, I agree with that. Okay, you're good with that? I am. Good, 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 because <laughs> there's some of these that I think are really spicy that I think I might need to persuade you a little bit about. Well, as far as that goes, why don't you tell me about our first honorable mention, Mausoleum Secrets. Ah, I love this card. I love this card. It's a tutor. It's an instant speed tutor. Uh, Mausoleum Secrets, one on a black, instant, undergrowth. When you cast it, you can go find any black card in your library with converted mana cost equal to or less than the number of creature cards in your graveyard. Right, gotcha. So the fact that this is an instant, I think, is really important. Generally, you know, we see we see cards like this, you know, tutors in combo decks. We see them in, uh, you know, legacy all the time. But tutors aren't something we often see in modern. I guess we saw them in like Traverse the the Olden Wall was like the True. most recent one that I could think of. But this one has some really interesting implications. I think that it could fit really nicely into Grixis Death Shadow. You know, you can cycle a Street Wraith. All of a sudden, you have one creature in yard. You can go find uh, some one cost black spell, like I don't know, Death Shadow, <laughs> uh, at instant speed after one's been removed. It's particularly good in that shell because the CMC of your main threat is is one. Exactly. Now, a Death Shadow is a pretty like mana efficient deck, so. Maybe a two cost spell isn't quite at home, but it can also find Thought Seize, it can find Fatal Push, it can find all sorts of um, sideboard options, like in green black X decks, you know, like Jund and Abzan and black green rock. Let's say you're playing against humans and the meddling mage is named Abrupt Decay or Assassin's Trophy. Right, and, and right. You need to go find, I don't know, the other version of it, you know, a Maelstrom Pulse or a Fatal Push or. Just whatever which, whichever card they didn't name, yeah. whichever one is still viable. You can hit it off Bloodbraid Elf, you can go fetch for a Lily. I don't know, I think I'm really excited to, to brew around this card, and I think we're going to be seeing it in some 5-0 lists pretty soon. Well, uh, I, while I agree with you, I, that's not my favorite out of the honorable mentions. I have to say that my vote uh, goes to Plague Crafter. Plague Crafter. Right, right, right. I remember we had some disagreement on this one. Plague Crafter, two and a black for a creature. Um, it's a human of some sort. I forget its subtype, but let's be honest, human is the subtype that matters here. Correct, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and it says it's a 3-2. When it enters the battlefield, each player sacrifices a creature uh, he or she controls uh, or a planeswalker he or she controls. And if they can't, discard a card. And so it's the planeswalker clause that interests me so much. Uh, I don't think we've ever seen a card printed where it is an edict type effect, but for a planeswalker instead of just a creature. Yeah, the only card I can think of is the Eldest Reborn, and, you know, five mana super linear enchantments are really not the modern way. Correct. 
I, I've tried playing a few of those, uh, namely Flame of Keld in Modern, and I was a little underwhelmed. Yeah, I think Flame of Keld is probably the one that gets closest. I mean, there's at least the 12 bolt deck. Correct. Um, you know, the Saffron Olive Special. Um, but Plaguecraft, okay, so you can hit Planeswalkers. When it enters, if they don't have a creature, you get a discard. So, so even if it's an empty board and you're you're you would otherwise not be able to cast it for value hitting a creature, you're still making them discard a card. Okay, okay, I'm coming around to this. I kind of I'm kind of surprised I didn't see this earlier, but I mean, you know that I play a little bit of humans in modern, and one of those I, people. I've heard. I like humans. I like five color humans. You can do a lot of fun stuff. Um, I'm just imagining like almost out of the sideboard. Like, you know, against a blue-white control player who has a Teferi or a Gideon Jura or a Jace. That would be incredible. Um, you know, like, especially since I can cast him off of a cavern, make sure that he's not countered. Um, vial him in off of an Aether Vial, make right. sure he's not countered that way, too. And he's a 3 CMC, so uh, in humans, you want your Vial on 3 anyways. Is, yeah. that, is that correct? Absolutely. It, it, of course, depends on the texture of your hand, but, you know, True. now that we have Bugler, Reflector Mage, Big Thalia, some other spicy ones we'll get to later in the list, Vial on 3 is going up and up and up. Well, so far we've covered Playcrafter and Mausoleum Secrets. I, I'm convinced that they both potentially have a spot in modern. Um, what about Glow Spore Shaman? I'm really interested in Glowspore Shaman. Now, it is a, a 2CMC, but I think we'll all remember how good Stitcher Supplier was out of nowhere. Right. Similar effect, not the same. Glowspore Shaman is uh, black-green for a 3-1 elf shaman. When it ETBs, you can put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard. Or not can, you have to. And then put a land from your graveyard on top of your library. And there we have it. That's the clause that I'm interested in. Um, you know, I, it gets me thinking about putting a Field of Ruin back on top, putting a Ghost Quarter back oh, on top. Oh, interesting. It gets me thinking of these black-green rock decks that are built around Tireless Tracker and Fetch Lands, and putting a Fetch Land back on top while also powering up your Goyf by, like, filling your graveyard. And So that um, seems right at home in the green-black X, green-black rock kind exactly. of Exactly, and since uh, Assassin's Trophy is sort of getting us there anyway, I think right. that, that maybe we, we might start to see this uh, sooner than expected. Interesting. So fill up the yard, make your goyf bigger, mm -hmm. potentially put a land, a fetch land back on top of your library while you have a tireless tracker on the battlefield. Get another couple clues, get another couple mm. counters. Yeah, you that see. That one seems particularly good. Low spore, you know. I like I'd it. I'd go see that shaman. Also, like, I can see it being okay in Bridgevine. You know, it's doing the thing that Bridgevine wants to do, which is putting creatures in yard. It is two mana. But I've definitely seen hands out of Bridgevine players where like, they just don't get to their third mana and they need to like start doing multiple things. And it can be kind of good, I think, in some spots to have the assurance that you're going to get a, a you know a land back next turn. Especially if it's against Tron and you're getting a Ghost Quarter back. That oh. can be particularly good. That can be incredible. <laughs> so next up, uh, we have a pretty straightforward one, but one that uh, I wanted to keep my eye on, and I think we, we kind of agreed on this one, a Necrotic Wound. Oh, uh, yes. That is the single black mana instant speed, mm -hmm. and it's another undergrowth card, isn't it? Exactly. Uh, target creature gets minus X, minus X, where X is the number of creatures in your graveyard. Bingo. And, importantly, if it would die this turn, exile it instead. That's right. I think that's actually the most important part about it. I think so, too, because obviously when we talk about a, a one black instant speed removal spell in modern, we've got to talk about Fatal Push. How can and you not? you got to compare it, you got to put them side by side and see how they match up. And I think, you know, obviously because Fatal Push, Fatal Push is conditional, but, you know, it, it answers anything that people do on turn one and two usually, in terms right. of creatures, and especially in all of these rock decks where you're going to be sacking a lot of lands anyway, um, you know, you can turn on Revolt pretty easily. Yeah. The thing that I like about this spell, obviously it can kill um, indestructible things, so that's that's an upside, the minus X, minus X. Oh, that's right, can that's grow. a state-based thing. Exactly. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, not a destroy effect, um, not a damage effect either, so I like that. I think that's more marginal, because we don't see a lot of indestructible cards in modern outside of good old Tintin, Ulamog, the oh, Ceaseless God. Hunger, and right. it's a lot of creatures and in the yard. Or the Gideon Jura. Oh. Uh, whenever he becomes, when you turn him into a 5-5, five five or whatever it is. That's true, I hadn't thought about that one, that's a good call. That's pretty interesting, yeah, actually. Yeah, 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 As, uh, I think his other clauses don't prevent anything like that, they don't give him expert for anything. No, I don't I think, think so. That's a good one, and you exile him, too, Ooh. cool. So other places that might be good, let's think, what about, um, I think you had mentioned Bridge from Below. Yes, so like, the thing, you, often, often Bridgevine decks do play a couple push in the sideboard. Mm. Um, you know, I don't think Necrotic Wound is necessarily going to be a four of in any, like, starters, like, um, anytime soon. But being able to have a one black removal spell that exiles the opponent's creature rather than putting it in the graveyard 
can sometimes protect your bridge from below because bridge from below has the clause that says you know whenever an opponent's creature dies if um, it's in your graveyard if it's a, yeah like exile it goes it. to your graveyard you know, yeah you exile bridge of below from your graveyard and so right. being able to exile it uh, exile the creature that you're killing and and sort of not have your bridge go away i think could be something that bridge mine is interested in and of course it's the deck that's going to have the highest value for X the highest amount of times. Right, because you're trying to put creatures in your graveyard as Vinge Vines and whatnot. Right. So. Also, dredge players might play it as a one or two up in the sideboard, too. Oh, because they also interact with their graveyard so heavily. Indeed. Oh, I see. Well, it looks like we're down to the last honorable mention. Uh, Quasi Duplicate. Quasi Duplicate. This is a Morgan Book special. <laughs> I know you were just super, super not on board with this one when I, I brought it up. I took some convincing, yeah. but I think I've come around. Okay. So it's a uh, one blue blue. T- tell us about the card. One blue blue. Gets worse. Sorcery speed. Mm. Um, and it says, create a token that's a copy of a creature that you control. So it can't copy your opponent's things. Also, also a drawback. But it also has jump start, meaning you can discard a card. Um, and cast it again from your graveyard. Nice. So, the reason that I like this card so much is because when I was looking at the jumpstart mechanic during the spoiler season, um, mm. I was, you know, I thought it was okay. I thought it was nothing super special. I thought it was rebranded flashback. And when I started playing with it in draft and in standard for testing, I just realized that it's a lot more powerful than I thought it was. Not having to pay extra and just getting to discard a card, which is sometimes an upside, is pretty good. So I, I looked for, like, the cheapest like rarest like jumpstart card that I could find right and I think quasi duplicates it and the interesting thing about it is you know if you can pair this with a big big hex proofer like you know I don't know a, a carnage tyrant or something like that or if you could that you could pair ideal. this with a, a Gurmog angler or a death shadow like sometimes death shadow will get to spots where it floods and it has like one or two big creatures but the opponent has a couple of creatures and they just can't find removal spells the difference between winning and not winning is finding a threat is one more threat exactly and quasi duplicate being this thing that can end up in the graveyard off of your own thought scours that can be pitched to faithless looting right that can uh, use these extra lands that you might draw in the late game to just make another death shadow make another Duramog. I don't know there could be something there there could be something there I think you're onto something yeah and also you you mentioned um, thing in the ice decks they've been a little bit popular lately um Flip a thing in the ice, and then quasi duplicate copy the already flipped thing in the ice. Doesn't that just warm your heart? My goodness! Yeah. So you flip it the first time, bounce all your opponent's creatures because you're gonna assume they're not horrors. Right. Uh, they start to rebuild. Um, P.S. I don't have to play another one and flip it. I'm just gonna copy no, the I already. I just have flipped. another. I just have another one. Here's wow. another seven. Uh, here's another seven eight to deal with. And if you have a brawl or a goblin electromancer out, which a lot of times these thing in the ice decks. Absolutely love these Electromancer effects that reduce the cost of instant sorceries. Right. Now all of a sudden you get to pitch other cards with flashback maybe. You get to pitch some other cards with jumpstart, like something like Radical Idea, which could potentially, you know, even see some I play. See. Okay. And, and and now all of a sudden you're really doing it. I mean one quasi duplicate and one thing in the ice turns into three thing in the ices. And wow. one of them, if you've played no other instance of sorceries, already has two counters removed from. So I think but it's got a potential in a few homes. There's some stuff to do with that, I think. Well, I think that about wraps up our honorable mentions. Yeah, those are honorable mentions. We had a little bit of disagreement there. I'm going to be interested to keep an eye on what happens with the format, but I think uh, our top ten is pretty solid, and I think we agreed on it. And out of these uh, these honorable mentions, last thing, which one do you think, uh, if any, mm-hmm. has the best chance of becoming heavily played, or played at all? Let's see here. So I think... I think Mausoleum Secrets is just a card with such incredible upside in decks that are already producing the requirement for it, you know, getting creatures in the yard. We, we were right. in a very, like, sweeper-heavy, um, we're in a very, like, you know, creature aggro-heavy meta. I think Mausoleum Secrets is going gonna, is gonna to be on the leaderboard soon. You know, you stole my answer. I was going to say that exact same <laughs> thing. <laughs> but uh, since you stole Mausoleum Secrets, I'm going to have to go with Plague Crafter, I think. Okay. Uh, it's... Rather unassuming, but I think on the right deck, probably humans out of the sideboard, that it actually has some some sweet tech. Yeah, it's an effect we've never seen before, and those are always interesting. Well, I guess that's on to the top ten, huh? Let's do it. Sweet. Awesome. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to be going number ten through number one, leading up to the best of the sleepers. And, um, yeah, let's go ahead and start with number ten. Number ten. 
I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just always wanted to do that. I loved it. I, I thought I'll it was quit. great. I'll quit. <laughs> but for real though, what's number ten? So we're starting with uh, Tajik Legion's Edge. Legion's Edge. Excuse me. Yeah. Legion's Edge. Like I said, I'm a humans player, and yes. this card I think is really good for modern. And the only reason it's number ten is because humans players are already playing one ofs in the main. I've looked at some modern 5-0 lists. I've looked at um, some, you know, IQs that were put on by SCG and some uh, modern classics. And there are a couple of uh, like-minded humans players out there that are playing one in the main, but I think it goes a lot further than that. So Tajik is one white red for a 3-2 human warrior. Uh, he has haste. He also has mentor. So whenever he attacks, it's one of the new uh, mechanics from Ravnica. You know, it's the Boros right. mechanic. Whenever he attacks, put a plus one, plus one counter on another attacking creature with lesser power. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. Gotcha. It has to be attacking along with uh, Tajik and also has to be uh, smaller in terms of the power. Also has the added ability, prevent all non-combat damage that would be dealt to other creatures you control. I and guess. on top of all that, if you thought that the, that wasn't enough text, don't worry, there's more. Um, he also <laughs> has the ability, pay a white and a red. Uh, Tajik gains first strike until end of turn. Now, Ooh. that's mostly flavor text uh, in humans, because humans doesn't actually have a way of producing red mana. It has the added benefit, too, of being able to get cast it off of a Blood Braid Elf, so we could even see oh, some wow. some Naya Zoo kind of implications for Tajik as well. My goodness. Well, I certainly think that deserves a spot on this list. Absolutely. So, uh, Tom, why don't you tell us about the number nine card? Sure. So number nine, we decided on Justice Strike, and that is an instant that costs Boros colors, one red, one white. Mm -hmm. um, target creature deals damage to itself equal to its power. So you can kind of think of this as like the Boros Terminate, I suppose, is not mm. a bad comparison. Yeah, 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 I like that, I like that, you know, Terminate was a red-black and it had the can't-be-regenerated clause, but... You know, Justice Strike pretty much does the job that Terminate uh, Terminate does. There are definitely some important creatures in Modern that we'd be remiss not to mention that it does not hit. Correct. It hits just about everything, but the notable ones it does not hit are Goyf, because it's always going to have a toughness one greater than its power. Exactly. So that won't kill it. Uh, Tasker is another one that has a greater toughness than his power. He's a 4-5, isn't he? That's right, yeah. Tasker's a 4-5. Uh, and then cards like, I suppose, there's the off random 1-3s like uh, Militia Bugler and cards like that. Yeah, yeah. 2-3 is Militia Bugler, 1-2 is Kite Cell Freebooter, and 0-1 right. and is Noble Hierarch, so... Uh, I think it can certainly handle enough creatures in the meta to where it, uh, I, could, I could see it getting picked up. I'm playing in the right couple of decks. And you know, one of the things about, um, like, you do have to compare it to Lightning Helix in decks like Jeskai. Right. And there are some advantages, you know, Lightning Helix can be used to, you know, hit the opponent directly or it can be used to hit a Planeswalker. And it can also be used to gain life. And as we know, in you know a, an aggro creature meta and in a burn meta, gaining life is pretty important. But if they've meddling mage your lightning helixes, you're gonna want something else. Also, sometimes they play creatures that outgrow a lightning helix and you wanna remove it. You That's know, true. maybe they play uh, a Death Shadow, maybe they play, you know, a, a Gurmog Angler. Um, you know, maybe we see you know, any of these threats uh, that need to be dealt with and uh, Lightning Helix wouldn't be able to clean up. Right, it doesn't matter how large your Death Shadow gets, uh, if it's dealing damage to itself equal to its power, it's it's going down. Exactly. Well, uh, what was number eight on our list? Moving on up. So number eight is a really, really interesting one. I have a feeling it's going to be a little bit controversial. I think that there are going to be people out here who hear this and they're going to be like, yes, I love this card. And there are people <laughs> out there who are going to hear this and they're going to be like, what? This card could never get played in Modern. But but I'm I'm pretty excited to start playing around with it in certain spots. And that card is Thief of Sanity. All right, Thief of Sanity is a uh, one blue-black for a 2-2 two -two flying, I think, Spectre. I think that's um, right. And it says, has a big old, big old box of text on it. One of my favorite things to see in spoiler season. No flavor text, whole bunch of text. What does this guy do? Um, some really cool art, too. So he says that when he, or she, or he, attacks and deals combat damage to an opponent, you get to look at the top three cards of that opponent's library, and then grab a card from it, exile it, and as long as that card remains exiled, even if Thief of Sanity dies, you can cast that card, and you can use your mana as though it could produce any color in order to cast that card. My goodness, and and the ones that you don't choose is look at three, choose one, and the other two go to the graveyard. Is that That's right? right, exactly. So it's possible to give your opponent value by putting some cards in the yard for them. But in a lot of cases, they're going to be missing out on spells that they might want might have wanted to cast. 
um, right. by, by putting those cards in the yard. And I feel like this deck, or excuse me, this card shines particularly post-board, because uh, you have the option of taking away a, one of their sideboard cards that they would have drawn uh, off the top of their library. Oh, that's cheeky. That's pretty cheeky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and especially if you never cast it, because obviously why would you if it's something like... Probably never going to be in a Stony Silence deck, but you know something like that. Something with <laughs> yeah. a really uh, with, with a static effect that is bad for your <laughs> for your deck. And your opponents, unless they have their deck list memorized really well and they fetch and they go through and like piece together what it is that you've that you've taken. Ooh, um, that would take some serious brain power. It would. It would. <laughs> I've seen people do it with Bomat Couriers before. Um, people smarter than me, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, you know if if they don't if they can't do that they might wonder what cards under there now. The interesting thing I like about this card, and another thing, another reason that I think, like you said, it's it's ideal post board, is that like I think that if this card finds its way into modern, it's going to find its way into modern in the sideboard of decks like Grixis Control, and because Grixis is one of those decks that sort of spins its mana more incrementally over the over the late game rather than blue white control. Um, you know, where it drops a Planeswalker and tries to run away from there. Taps out for a Jace on turn four. Exactly. It's right. kind of nice It's kind of nice to have, like, a threat that on turn six you can play with three mana up to, you know, snap bolts or uh, snap push or, you know, just still be able to hold up, uh, hold up interaction while you can then beat in and start to get card advantage. And if you bring it in from the sideboard, you know, they're, they're probably thinking, like, well, this is Grixis Control. I need to be prepared for creatures like... Tassiger, right? Like creatures like Snapcaster. Right. Shoot, even creatures like Nicol Bolas. I know that the, the Ravager, like some people are playing that in Grixis' I, list. I'm thinking Cruel Ultimatum, even. I know it's not a creature, but just no. speaking of wild cards that uh, Grixis control players have been playing lately, Cruel Ultimatum is one of them. Good lord. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and being able to, like, bring in that threat post board when your opponent has probably removed. A, a decent amount of their interactive like removal pieces um, right, right. Uh, playing against a control deck I think has uh, has some pretty interesting implications on how the early game could play out for a Grixis control player. Definitely. This yeah. is one of the biggest question marks on the list I think but I think that it has such potential upside that it's going to be really interesting to watch it. Well uh, t tell me Morgan what, what's next on our list? That was number eight so number seven. So this was one that it, at first we didn't see eye to eye on right? I think that's right. How did you feel about this card at first? This uh, this card. Well, before we tell you the name, I will I will say that um, the CMC turned me off. Uh, I didn't think you'd ever be casting it in modern, but it's not actually about hard casting it for a CMC. And this is of course a uh, Arc Light Phoenix that Arc we're talking Light about. Light Phoenix, my friends. Bet you didn't expect to hear that one. <laughs> Honestly, when I was going through the uh, when I was going through the spoilers, looking for you know cards to, to showcase, I wasn't expecting to pick this card either. But I got to thinking about it, and, you know, the interesting thing about this card is that it's one of those sleepers that I don't really see it in too many spots in the meta right now where, where it can shine, and I don't really see it in too many in too many decks where it can shine. Like, I suppose I can see Arclight Phoenix. It's a 3 and a red for a 3-2 flyer with haste, and it says, uh, at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you have cast three or more instant and sorcery spells. Then you may return it from the graveyard uh, to the battlefield exactly. under, your, under your control. And notably not tap and attack. You do not have to attack with this phoenix, but you can because it does have haste. Oh, I see. Yeah. Cho choices are power. The fact that you can choose to attack or not to attack I think is quite good. Absolutely. That's a great note. And, you know, this guy's interesting. So, you know, I, I can see him. There are some decks that cast three instants and sorceries. That is so many to cast in one turn, and it's generally not something you can do routinely, like right. two or three turn cycles in a row. And that's the first thing that initially turned me off about this card. I mean, I could see it maybe being good sometimes, and you know, the Saffron Olive Special 12 Bolt. Um, right. Yeah, I can see it being decent in Storm because you know you post board like since your opponent's probably preparing for. Um, Thing in the ice, they might be preparing for Grim Lava Mancer or, or even right. like Empty the Warrens. They might not see, you know, this Phoenix that that you can reanimate from the graveyard. You know, that you can go grab with Gifts Ungiven if you want to right. as well. Right, you grab it with Gifts Ungiven, and the turn when you're going off, you play way more than three instants and sorceries. Oh yeah, and you don't. It's not that the Storm Claws. You know, it's not like the storming off with Grape Shot is what gets that gets this guy back because those are copies. It's all the rituals that you're casting. It's all the air right. in your deck. You know, the opt, the scry, the the serum visions. Um, 
you know, stuff like this. Like it, it can really add up and putting a clock on your opponent while, you know, shoving a thing in the ice on the ground seems like a really great backup plan if your opponent is brought in like combo killers as their as their sideboard. Like, right. oh, I surgical your grape shot. And you're like, hey man, that's fine. I've got this three, two bird and this seven, eight wall. And uh, you know. And I'm gonna keep bringing it back. Absolutely, because <laughs> I'm gonna cast a lot of rituals. And if I if I don't return it from my graveyard, I'll just cast it from my hand because it's easy to do that with a brawl or an electromancer or two. Right. And I think that if we get a good enough one drop uh, uh, jumpstart card or like a busted enough two drop even. So I think it's gonna be controversial. I don't think it's I don't think it's going to be easy to build around, but I think that if we just get one or two specific cards, this card can be seriously, seriously powerful. Well, hopefully we see that one drop or really good two drop jumpstart spell in the next set. It's my favorite thing. I'm going to be watching the spoilers now for the next ones and, and just pouring over them looking for that one Where's spell. the jumpstart? Where's Is the jumpstart? Today? <laughs> can my phoenix live today? Will he, will he finally get to fly? <laughs> um... But enough about uh, enough about <laughs> uh, questionable mythic phoenixes. Why don't we Why don't we move on to the number six slot? Tell us about the number six slot. Tom. Sure. Well, uh, at six, I think we agreed. Uh, Legion War Boss. The exact text is two in red for a goblin. He's he's not legendary. He's a two two, uh, and he says um, at the, he has mentor. Importantly, mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of combat on your turn, create a one one red goblin token. That token gains haste, and must attack this turn if able. So this is another one that I, I kind of wasn't expecting to include. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I could see its place. Uh, I remember going through and looking at some MTG Goldfish results, and there was an SCG Modern IQ um, on October 7th. And the first place deck it was a Mardu Pyromancer deck. and. One of the only differences that I saw on this list was it was not only running, you know, the the young pyromancer Bedlam Reveler four and two or four and three split. It was also running two two Legion War Bosses in the main. Oh my goodness! What do you think about that? So this card has already made an impact, at least in a small way, on modern. Uh, someone that got first place at a big Star City Games event. I'm uh, I'm impressed. I got to thinking about it, and obviously Rabble Master is the first card that came to mind. Right, as a, as a comparison. This is like a baby Rabble Master. Exactly. In a way. And like, people weren't excited about this compared to Rabble Master. And I think it's kind of fundamentally because they're doing very different things even though they look very similar. Um, like, Rabble Master is one of those cards because of the plus X plus O clause. Where, you know, if you're a control deck or if you're a deck where, you know, like Grixis Death Shadow where people have to one for one your threats constantly because they're so dangerous. Right, right. You can end up in this spot where the board's empty, the hands are empty, people are top decking and you need to end the game quickly. And, you know, putting a, a Legion War Boss out there or putting a Rabble Master out there is like right. a way to like quickly accelerate that game to be over. Um, and I'd say Rabble Master is a lot faster because of the pl plus X plus O clause, but Legion War Boss also does a pretty good job of ending games quickly. And so like, even in a deck like, I don't know, eight -way, since you played 8 Wack for, for a good while. Man, I love that deck. It's so fun. It's so fun to watch, too. It's just, mm -hmm. it's the classic, like, uh, you know, and it's turn one, and it's turn two, and it's game two. <laughs> yes, I'm swinging for 18. Have yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> Do the math yourself. I've done it many times. Well, um, math is for blockers. That's what I always say. And so <laughs> you look at Legion War Boss, like, initially in spoiler season, and you think to yourself, ah, yeah, sure, it'd be great to include something like him in, a, in, in 8 Wack, but, like, you know, if I want to give this guy haste, which is really where I want to be. I want to be mentoring them, especially with the, with the plus one plus O effect. Um, but that's a pretty high like mana investment. If you want to give your Legion War Boss haste, you have to sort of like, you know, you have to kick the um, the Bushwhacker mm. while also having the mana to play the War Boss. But you know, if we are in a, in a in a meta where we expect to see a lot of trophy, where we expect to see maybe some people playing around with. Snapcaster maging into trophy a whole bunch, or that sounds um, good. You know, even a card that we're going to mention a little bit later in Assassin's Trophy a whole bunch, or um, you know, Abzan doing like Path to Exile and Assassin's Trophy stuff. Yikes! It might actually make sense to you know start to include these mid or threats that the mana disadvantage of them being more expensive al almost isn't a thing because it allows you to sort of pre-plan your threats for the presence of Assassin's Trophy and right. for the presence of Path to Exile 
And, and like, you know, we also haven't mentioned that, you know, one of the decks that is going to see more play and has already seen more play from Trophy uh, is Jund. And Jund likes to run our old friend Bloodbraid Elf. Oh, goodness. And that can hit a Legion War Boss. That can uh. hit a Legion War Boss. And it can also, it also produces a hasty 1 1 to attack along with your Elf for, you know, a uh, extra hasty damage. Yeah. We even have the Ponza setup where you start with, you know, a turn one Utopia Sprawl or a turn one Noble or a turn one Birds. And then all of a sudden, you know, on turn, like ideally in Ponza, on turn on turn two, you can cast a four cost spell. Like, right. what if that spell happened to be a Blood Braid? And what if that, you know, Blood Cascade Braid. Trigger happened to be a Legion War Boss? Well, now on turn two, you're doing what Humans does, you know, when it swings in Exalted for four, uh, only you're doing it across uh, technically three bodies. Um, and on turn two. On turn two. My and goodness. then you can start mentoring on turn three. And I think that we are in a meta where, where it can shine. But we'll see. We'll see. Right. Uh, for these next two, they're actually so similar that we're going to talk about them together. We've got uh, Ionize and also Expansion and Explosion. Ionize and Expansion Explosion. So I feel like uh, whichever deck these go into in Modern, they both go into the same deck. I'm thinking probably like a Blue Moon or some kind of blue-red spells matters type deck. Absolutely. And, you know, I think recently people have been experimenting more and more with these sorts of blue-red tempo aggro decks. Of course, when we, we, we talk about blue-red decks in modern, first thing we think of is... Uh, uh, for, for me, uh, Storm, yeah. perhaps, or Blue Moon. Or Blue Moon, exactly. Right. Um, more recently, we've seen, um, you know, the Prowess uh, sort of Delver-style deck. Ooh, and also, um, what was that, uh, the Blue Red Wizards Oh, yeah, Hoogland, well. Hoogland Wizards, as I call it. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, these are, these are decks that are sort of understanding that the format is very tempo aggro. And also understanding that if, if, if they can be tempo aggro while also holding up um, some interaction, uh, some really valuable blue and red interaction, then it's actually kind of a good way to beat other tempo aggro decks. And a lot of these threats uh, hit in the air, too. Right, right. And what we're seeing with both Ionize and Expansion Explosion, I guess we'll talk a little bit about Ionize first, because we do technically have it as number five on the list, with Expansion Explosion as number four. Sure. Um, but again, like we said, it, it's definitely, the, these are two peas in the pod. And Ionize is another one of those effects that we just haven't seen before at the rate that we're getting. You know, a counter spell, in red and blue that comes with damage. Right, and that is one colorless, one red, one blue for an instant that says counter target spell, uh, deal two damage to that spell's controller. That's right, deal two damage yeah, to that spell's yeah. controller. It's, it's uh, you know, it's the perfect thing to do um, when, you're, when you've already got, you know, a lock with a Delver and you need to just keep the beats coming and, you know, eventually you're gonna get, you're gonna get them down to multiple range, you're gonna get them down to, right. uh, you know, burst lightning range. Um, Maybe even Lava Spike range. I don't know if we're going into Lava Spike territory, but maybe. Well, a lot of the decks it's good in are Snapcaster or Lightning Bolt kind of decks. I hadn't even thought about Snapcaster. Snapcaster goes into Wizards, and yes. uh, it goes into Blue Moon, doesn't it? I think I think it does. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're playing Logic Knot, even though you have to delve stuff away sometimes, uh, just because it's that two-man option. Right, and, and if you're willing to Logic Knot, I feel like you are also willing to ionize. Yeah. But that's coming from a player that's not very well versed in control. Well, and the thing is, like, this this is a counter spell that is not just a control counter spell. You know, and usually when we think of counter spells that are in the tempo aggro domain, we think of spells like, you know, remand, right? You know, counter yes. spells that aren't actually hard counter spells, but they're just very, very castable and very cheap. Um, and you can do some fun stuff with them, like in Storm, you know, where you remand your own remand to get up your, your storm count and, right. and, and draw a card. <laughs> um, now, Expansion Explosion. Yes. Probably the card, I don't want to say my favorite, I don't want to say the best, but probably the card I am most excited to test with in Modern. And tell me about that one. What, uh, what exactly uh, is, the, is the card text? Okay, so Expansion Explosion is the Is It Split uh, Rare um, from Guilds of Ravnica. The first half, uh, they're both instant, the first half reads... Is it hybrid? Is it hybrid? So that's blue, red, blue, red. Right. Uh, two, two CMC total. Choose target, or no, copy target instant or sorcery spell with converted mana cost four or less. You may choose new targets for the copy. That's right. Yeah. I'm imagining that you wouldn't want to copy any one drop instant or sorcery. That's just not enough value. But no. um, Well, I mean, sometimes you would, right? Sometimes you copy your own bolt for the win. Yeah, right. definitely. Absolutely. Uh -huh. That's true. Yeah. But the thing that really interests me here is 
Okay, let me put it to you this way. Sure. Let's say you know you're playing this like this tempo aggro deck. This this is it uh, prowess or like is it tempo aggro deck? Maybe even a thing in the ice deck. You know, and um, uh, you, you are playing against blue white control or maybe maybe even Grixis, and you know you do something that they've just really got to stop because their life total is getting low. And it's their right. turn four, and they're like, you know what? Okay, you play that thing. I can't have you playing that thing. I'm gonna go ahead and cryptic tap four. Modes I choose right. are counter target spell, draw a card. You're like, hey man, that's great, awesome. Uh, I only left two red mana up, but that's fine because I'm gonna tap both of them and cast uh, expansion, oh, and I'm gonna goodness. I'm gonna copy your cryptic command. I see where you're going. Now with I can't this. choose different modes. I have to keep the modes that you took, right? So right. like, if you have a wide board. And like you, you think that they're gonna do the like tap your creatures effect, you know? Maybe you don't do it then, because like control doesn't have any of that. But I mean, right. they're gonna be plenty of times when they need to counter a spell and draw a card, and you go, no, you know, I'm, I'm gonna copy that cryptic. I'm gonna use the counter target spell mode to counter your cryptic, and then I'm, and gonna, I'm draw gonna draw a card, and your cryptic is not gonna resolve. Like, mm. how much of a blowout would that be? That's Probably going to win you the game. Yep. Even though it's only turn four and there's a lot of game left, that is that is some serious value. Now think about this. Think about this. What if what if that happened from the control or from from like from like the burn player's point of view? Or or like some other deck that just like right. doesn't run blue. This is a spell. This is a spell that can functionally serve as a counter spell against control decks and out of the red. board in mono red decks. Wow, yeah. they're not going to see that coming. No, no one, no one plays around Twin Blast. <laughs> no, one, no one plays around Double Cast. <laughs> Let me look at your lands. Yeah. You got two mountains. What could, um, what could it be? Mountain, mountain out of the Burn player. I don't think it's twin a counter blast? spell. Is it Twin Blast? <laughs> it's got to be Twin Blast. <laughs> oh my uh, goodness! Ran that cryptic right into my Twin Blast. No one, <laughs> no one's ever thought of that in their mind in the history of Magic. <laughs> no. Um, but now we're in this world where, even if you're willing to never get value from. You know, from the uh, explosion. Exactly. Um, you have this awesome red, red, um, you know, just value card that you can board in. Um, and, and we can't neglect explosion. As awesome no. as expanse could be, uh, explosion is X, blue, blue, red, red. Mm -hmm. So let's be honest. You're going to be casting the first half of this card, expanse, much more often than, than you're going to be casting explosion. Absolutely. Uh, but it is the uh, Sphinx's revelation, and is it essentially draw X cards? And deal X damage. The the Sphinx's conflagration, if you will. <laughs> I like that. Uh, because is it is is generally not not a guild that has much time to sit around and wait for revelation. Um, which right. is why you know you're probably gonna cast expansion most of the time. But uh, top deck late game cast explosion for the win. Again, this has Grixis control written written all over it for me. Like you know, like a a, a deck that's comfortable getting into the late game where it has a lot of extra mana. You know, a deck yes. that can support blue, blue, red, red. Um, you know, even Blue Moon could do something like this. Um, some deck that runs a lot of rituals. This could be an alternate win con and storm where people are planning. Um, oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, people, people, because people are planning on empty. They're planning on thing. They're planning on you know just like these alternate win cons to to vary the grape right. shot, the only grape shot plan. All of a sudden, you bring in a couple expansion explosions, um, and not only do you have some really really flexible early like plays. Unfortunately. Expansion doesn't get reduced by any of your Electromancers or anything like that, but right. there are matchups where we bring those out. Um, but you go off, you do like a mini storm, and but, oh, I guess it wouldn't be quite very many. Mm -hmm. uh, but deal eight damage to their face, draw eight cards. Absolutely, yeah, something like that. Absolutely. Maybe I'm not quite sure how um, Past in Flames, the wording of Past in Flames interacts with split cards like Expansion Explosion. Like whether or not it would grant them flashback, or whether or not the flashback cost would be the total CMC of the card, or just interesting one or the other, depending on which you chose. Because I think Pass in Flames is that like like all instants and sorceries in your yard this turn gain flashback. Their flashback cost is equal to their mana cost. I'm just I'm just not sure what is the mana cost of those cards. Is exactly. it split up individually or is it six? Right. Because, so we'll oh, have to look I into see. that. I bet you someone who's listening will know the answer to that. If you do. Please put it in the comments and tag us. We would love to hear it. Tag MTG Tournament Grinder, because that's that's an interesting question for me. All right, so next on the list, uh, so remember that was number five, Ionize, and number four, Expansion Explosion, together. Mm -hmm. um, next, we're moving into the top three. Dun, dun, dun. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba, the top three. Okay, so number uh, three. Why don't you tell us about number three, Tom? Sure. It looks like we've got Runaway Steamkin. Whoa, whoa, what? <laughs> Runaway Steamkin. 
when we were talking about this card, we decided that it might be at home in uh, the modern storm deck mm -hmm. uh, because it has the synergy of making mana actually remind like me it, what the card does. Like it gets you, oh right, 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 right. Um, so uh, Runaway Steamkin is one and a red for a 1-1 one, one elemental. Um, and it says whenever you cast a red spell, put a 1-1 one, one counter on Runaway Steamkin. That's right. As long as it has fewer than three 1-1 one, one counters. Mm. So can't, can't top three. Maybe. Um, <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have we got something planned for you? Uh, um, it it uh, basically it has the ability that if you remove three one one counters, you add red 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 to your mana pool. I see. So you know, and if you happen to cast three red spells with that mana, you add another three counters. And if you want to cast three red three more spells, red spells with that mana, then you know another three counters. You know, and it's interesting because like you know in storm. Storm is definitely one of those decks that really tries to vary its lines of attack and make it hard to predict in game two. You know, it's like... And you're it, certainly casting three spells in a turn, on your go-off turn with Storm. Oh, yeah, easily. Like, like, and, and so, like, basically, it's, it's almost like this savings account for rituals, right? Where you're just like, spend a ritual, put some away. Spend a ritual, put some away. Spin a ritual, put some away. Oh, I got a free ritual. Oh, yeah, you know? I see. Right, right. If you're familiar with The Office, it's like the Kevin Malone Big Mac plan. The time you buy a Big Mac, put one part of the Big Mac to the side, and after a certain uh, amount of Big Macs, you've got a whole free Big Mac. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin is my favorite. <laughs> but yeah, you know, so Runaway Steamkin is the Big Mac plan of, uh, of of Storm, maybe. And you know, Storm likes to give some given for some weird things. Right. And so uh, this could easily be one of them, but that is not not even close to why we put that guy in this list. Right, there's a few other cool uh, things you could do with it. Perhaps in a Bloodbraid Elf deck, it gets a hit off a of Bloodbraid Elf. It is a hit off a of Bloodbraid, and it can also, like, you know, a lot of Bloodbraid Elf decks uh, also feature Blood Moon. Um, and, right. it, you know, you, you can cast a Blood Moon off of its three counters. It does give you red, red, red. Oh, I see. Um, so you are, you're a player who's been playing Affinity for a long time. That's correct. That's my introduction to the modern format. Yeah, and it took you a while, but I understand you did recently make a swap over to Hardened Scales Affinity. It's true. There's been a mass exodus of uh, traditional Affinity players making the switch, and I, I'm officially joining the club. I seem to remember uh, the first night that you did it, um, you went 4 out, right? A little bit of beginner's luck, I, you know, perhaps. Sure, sure. <laughs> so, uh, beginner's luck, okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, so, I was thinking about Hardened Scales with this card, okay? Hear me out. Hear me out. Hardened Scales and Runaway Steamkin. So Hardened Scales and Runaway Steamkin on the battlefield at the same time. You cast a red spell, you get two counters. Right? Instantly, instead of just the one. Exactly. Right. Now let's say you cast another red spell. So I think that this is how the rules work. Again, if there are any rules lawyers out there, let us know if we're wrong or right in the comments down below. Um, but I think what the way that it works is because when you're casting the red spell, it checks how many counters are on the Steamkin, and it sees that there are only two. So it puts right. a counter on the Steamkin, and then Hardened Scales see that, sees that counter go on the Steamkin, uh. and it says, I want to put another counter on because I'm Hardened Scales, and that's right. what I do. If a counter would be placed, then place one more. Exactly. Oh, exactly. So like sort of via stack interaction, getting around the drawback of Steamkin. And so at this point, now you've got four counters on your Steamkin. You can remove three of those to add red, 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 and now just one red spell puts you back up to three counters because now you've stuck, you've got one oh counter remaining over from the three that you removed. And then, because it doesn't say remove all 1-1 counters, it says right. remove three 1-1 one -one counters. And I see. at this point, the next spell, the next spell gives you another three. So whatever brew we come up with when you're having red and green, both hardened scales and steam kin, it's a can, tough order. It's a tough order. It would be a tough build, but you go from two counters to four. Uh, you, you use three of them to make three red mana. Perhaps just use one of those red mana to cast like a Gal Blast or something, and then right. you've got three more mana. So you can have five mana in your mana pool. Use it to cast a Walking Ballista if it, if it makes it into the final. Dear God! Into the final build yeah, of this, this theoretical mm -hmm. deck we're talking about. Sure, sure. That could be insane. That sounds very nice. And the, see, the, the the cool thing about it too is that like um with that particular interaction. You know, it used to be that, like, you know, it, three red spells is what got you three counters. But three red spells, in this case, gets you six counters, which just so happens to be two activation. And not to mention, if you don't want to take those counters off, you know, you can you can just attack with your 5-5, five five, you know? Mm -hmm. That's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> then second man face, turn it into a huge right? ballista and just shoot him, shoot face. Bingo. 
Uh, imagine having multiple hardened scales or multiple steam cans. Mm -hmm. That would just get absolutely out of control. And I'm sure it doesn't stop with uh, with hardened scales. I'm sure there are other ways you can build this card. But when I saw this card, uh, you know, I, I immediately thought, you know, there th someone is going to know how to build this deck in modern. Right. Someone is going to figure out how to break this card. I'm looking at the text on it, and I know. I just know that this card is breakable, and and someone's gonna figure it out. Might not be us, although we're gonna get to work on that. Yes. On that hardened skill system, aren't we? <laughs> if it's not us, then it's some smart feller out there that is gonna crack yeah. the code. Feller or, or gal, as yes. it were. But absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. um, so that's number three. Uh, why don't you tell us about number two on the list? All right, well, approaching the finish line, already at number two. Uh, this card is, I'm quite excited about it. Uh, mission briefing. Mission Briefing. Why don't you brief me on Mission Briefing? So, it's a blue-blue sorcery? Instant. Instant. Thank you. Sorceries don't have any place on this list. Uh, That's yeah. why Quasi-Duplicates in only an honorable, honorable mention. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason, too. But it's a uh, when you cast Mission Briefing, uh, choose target instant or sorcery in your graveyard, and you may cast it. Uh, this turn, it doesn't give it flashback, it just says you may cast it this turn. That's right, so which means you can pay alternate cost. However, you miss one part of it. Probably the important part. You surveil two uh, yeah. before you even cast the instant in the sorcery. That is the important part. Yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously, when you when you talk about this card, we've got we've to compare it to Snapcaster, right? Like, why right. would you play this card if you could just play Snapcaster? Because Snapcaster comes with a 2-1 buff. But I think that there are some good reasons, like the, the not the least of which being that it goes pretty well with Snapcaster. Like, like Snapcaster targeting mission briefing. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Like, because because here's the thing, sometimes you get into spots where, you know, you might not have any more instants and sorceries in your graveyard because, you know, there are some decks that snap and run uh, Angler, you know, like a Gurmog Angler. Like Death Shadow. Um, like Death Shadow, that's right. There are decks that, um, you know, just like go through, go through their graveyard, uh, you know, a lot. And eventually you might be in a spot where you draw you're a Snapcaster, and because you mission briefing to target a spell earlier in your yard, the only spell you have left is mission briefing. So in these spots, I think I see where you're going this with with this. You you target mission briefing, which uh, surveils before the you, you choose an instant or sorcery. Exactly. So exactly. With an empty graveyard other than mission briefing, you actually have a chance to put a relevant instant or sorcery in there. Exactly. And in the in the late uh, games of these like Grixis control decks, which are like like probably maybe even maybe even blue white control you know the decks that can comfortably comfortably play a blue blue instant like this right um, that like you sort of need to be in the mid to late game to use effectively um, these sorts of decks I think are gonna find it a lot easier because like especially with Grixis sometimes you'll just accelerate through all of your graveyard stuff and you just need a little bit more to keep going because Grixis doesn't right. have a, a very fast clock you know they they sort of need to beat in with like two damage here you know. Um, some creeping tar pits there, you know, uh, right. maybe a nickel bolos if they're if they're counter everything you cheeky. do, remove everything that I let resolve, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. eventually nickel and dime you to death. Exactly. With a card like Mission Briefing, it gives you the ability to just restock on your graveyard a little bit more, so you can find some stuff to pick up with Kolagon's command, or like find right. a spell to Snapcaster, and and so like you know if you get into a spot where you need a specific answer, and it's not in your graveyard, and you snap. You know, all you're getting is a 2-1. And there are plenty of boards where, like, a 2-1 is not the out that you need. Right. But if the out that you need is, like, a spell, then in that case, you know, being able to mission briefing to, like, with no with no instants and sorceries in Yard, get right. the surveil first. Right. And possibly find an out. It's small math, but it's important math. In, in, a, in a decent number of spots, that's going to be something that hard control decks, um, or even, like, hard combo decks that want to dig and recast, are really going to value. I totally agree. And uh, speaking on agreeing, I think we both mm -hmm. agreed what our number one slot should be. Oh yeah, we pretty much said it simultaneously when we got to number one. And yes. Then, like, <laughs> and then like did a freeze frame, like jump in the air, and then like time just froze. Freeze frame that. Yeah, it was like high five. It was. <laughs> yeah. um, but then once you do the big reveal for us. All right, that card is risk factor. Risk factor. Risk factor. Risk factor is two and a red for an instant that says, you know, when you cast Risk Factor, your opponent has to choose between you taking four damage. Uh, and if they, do take, if they don't take the four damage, you draw three cards. I see. And, so, and they choose. You cast a spell, they choose either, okay, I'll take four, or you can draw three cards. Right. I see. Mm -hmm. And, and um, also, notably, it has Jumpstart. So you can discard a card from your hand and pay the converted mana cost of, or, you know, pay the spell's cost again. And 
you can cast it again from your graveyard. What decks do you think this is at home in? I think it's, I've already seen it played in a few burn lists. So this is one of those cards that like, I had to I had to convince, you know, a, a, a lot of my buds that like, this was a totally different card than Browbeat, right? Because um, obviously Browbeat is what we compare this to. Right. There's a lot of comparisons in this top 10. Mm -hmm. Mission Breaking the Snap, the Cardic Wound to Fatal Push. Mm -hmm. This one's comparison is Browbeat. That's right. Browbeat is sort of a notoriously bad card. Um, it does one more point of damage. I think it does five instead of four. But you get, uh, it's, it's at sorcery speed, and it has the same cost. It's a two and a red, sorcery speed does five instead of four, and then you can draw three if they don't take the five. But it doesn't have jumpstart. It doesn't have jumpstart, jump and it's not really... instant speed. Punisher cards are notoriously bad, right? And you know, that's, that's one of the first things you learn when you start to you know, level up in, you know, in, in, in play match. It's one of the first things I learned was like, oh man, Vexing Devil looks like an awesome card, and it still is in some spots, but like, you know, if my opponent can just be like, uh, you know, yeah, you know, uh, it's fine. You can keep your vexing devil. I'll you know kill it with my fatal push, or you know, like right. block it at some point. That's fine with me. In a vacuum, it can seem quite good. Exactly. But in a real game of magic, where there's fatal pushes, exactly. Not so much. You've got oh, I've got a I've got a four one on one. This is gonna crush my goldfish, and it will. But it, it rarely <laughs> crushes uh, an opponent who can make the the decision that's less bad for them. <clears throat> right. But this card is six mana across two spells that either does eight damage to your opponent, or draws six cards, or or, or four and three. Wow. Yeah. And, and the decks where this is playable, which I kind of have to say is almost any red deck, uh, with a, Let me think. some exceptions. No, no, I think you're right, because... I think it's good in burn. We said that. Mardu, I think it's right at home. Absolutely. you want to draw three cards, like you already do off You're of... already pitching cards to Faithless Looting and Mardu Pyromancer, too, right? right? So, like, pitch pitch a, pitch a risk factor to Faithless Looting, and, you know, you've got your self-card advantage right there. Oh, and also just by casting it, you get the you get the tokens, right? You get the oh, that's right. If you if you have young Peasy already on mm -hmm. the battlefield, yeah, young Peasy and life is easy with risk factor. <laughs> it's just called factor at that point. There's no risk. <laughs> um, it, I, I feel like it's kind of unprecedented that we get a card with this level of power for any any deck that can comfortably cast red on three and in modern. Gosh, that's so many decks. It's, it's certainly outside of the color pie for red. Jund even is another example. Oh, oh God, I hadn't even considered. Like cast uh, Bloodbraid Elf, hit Risk Factor, <laughs> now take oh four on top of the hasty damage, or give me three cards. It's like that, there is no good answer. Wow, If wow. you're sitting across from that, that is not good for you. No, no, what a, what a <laughs> terrible decision to have to make uh, facing down a 3-2 Haster. Like, uh, oh my goodness. And, and you cast it for free, and then once it goes to your yard, you know you're not done with it. You know you're going to find that unless you find a way to stabilize yourself, um, right. you know, you're going to have problems. Now, I, I have noticed that blue-white decks are playing, like, one timely main deck nowadays. Uh, a lot of the 5-0 lists have, like, a timely in there. And the timely reinforcements. Mm -hmm. and, and, like, if, if we see Risk Factor do what I think it's going to do in the format over time, um, then I think we're probably going to see some adjustments in that direction so that you know, blue white can just take the depending on how many copies you see of risk factor anywhere from you know eight to uh, twenty four. Twenty four. Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh my god! Oh lord! What if you expansioned it? <laughs> oh, oh, it's a copy of two really new targets. Funny. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's Jeez. good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, like you said, it goes into pretty much any blue red deck. Um, right. like, like you know, blue moon, uh, blue red thing. Um, you know, it goes into Grixis. Probably a welcome addition to Storm. Um, you know, again, as another card advantage source to find off of gifts I'm given. Now, I'm not. this for one red mana if you have like double Electromancer. Oh, man. That's a, that's a world oh, I want to live in. Goodness. For sure. That's that's a world I want to live in forever, uh, right there. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, like, I, I really do think that this card has the potential to be a game changer. And. I'm interested to see if I'm right or if I'm wrong. I'm interested to see, um, you know, how we sort of, how we sort of measure up. But but if my instincts and if our instincts are correct on this card, I just think that it is going to be one of the funnest cards to play with in modern. I'm I'm pumped to play it in in Jund, oh, yeah. you know, next to my Tarmogoyfs. You know, where I can like discard some stuff to jump start to grow my Tarmogoyf at instant speed. That sounds fun. Oh, right? I see. That's you know? Oh, he's got a 4-5 Tarmog Wolf. There's no way he could possibly grow it at instant speed with a risk factor <laughs> That's what in you his think. graveyard. You know, hide that <laughs> card, you know, put the other cards in front of it in your graveyard, and then just, you know, <laughs> dump a Mishra's Bobble or whatever it is, or, you know, a Planeswalker, whatever you need. 
Right, right. Just added value. Well, we, you did it, Morgan. You got to the end. Did we do it? I think we did it. Oh, man, I'm glad we did it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we've ranked these from 10 leading up to number one in terms of which is the most sleepy of the sleepers. I exactly. guess is a way to say it. Exactly. Which one is the most being slept on? Well, uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, and as usual, if you enjoy content like this, you can let me know in the comments below or by hitting that subscribe button. So uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, I've been Thomas. And I'm Morgan. And I'll see you guys next time.